Okay, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, Michael Rubel from the National Museum of American Jewish Military History in Washington, D.C. It's a pleasure to be here today with uh, Rabbi Joshua Ger Gerstein. He is the editor of Love and Kisses Charlie, World War II Letters from a Jewish American Serviceman. Uh, the book is near daily letters uh, written from training through post-war Europe, where Charlie Fletcher, uh, Rabbi Gerstein's grandfather, served. He served in Europe until 1946, mostly with the 102nd Infantry Division. Uh, the, the type of wartime correspondence that's compiled in the book, uh, written home to parents and families, are really valuable resources to us, but they can also at times uh, be a little frustrating. They were The letters were written at least in part to reassure worried parents that things were safe. So we don't always get some of the details of the war that we want. But what we do get is a really pretty vivid uh, depiction of the daily life of an individual soldier. And, you know, when museum visitors come in and ask big picture questions like, what's it like being Jewish in the military? What was it like to be a Jewish soldier in World War II? You know, there's over, over half a million uh, different answers to the question, what was it like to be a Jewish soldier in World War II? Everyone had their own unique sources, but unique stories. But because of sources like Charlie Fletcher's letters, uh, we have some great answers to that question. And, and, and in this case, about what the war was like for Charlie Fletcher and the lessons we learn from his experiences and from his correspondence certainly apply to a lot of Jewish service members that served in World War II. So I want to thank Rabbi Gerstein for making you know, what really must have been a, a huge effort to get these letters into book forms. Um, we will get to questions at the end. I want to ask people to use the uh, Zoom Q&A function, and uh, you can feel free to start entering questions whenever you like. We will get to them at the end. Rabbi Joshua Gerstein currently serves as a captain in the IDF military rabbinate. He holds rabbinical ordination as well as a bachelor's degree in psychology from Toro College and a master's degree in Jewish education from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His other published works include A People, A Country, A Heritage, two volumes of original essays on the weekly Torah portion. Originally from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Rabbi Gerstein immigrated to Israel in 2007. He lives in Jerusalem with his wife and family, where he joins us from today. Rabbi Gerstein, thanks so much for being here. <clears throat> Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone uh, who joined uh, the webinar to, uh, to hear uh, the story. Um, so I'll start from the beginning. I'll start uh, about uh, the book itself, um, the story uh, that it tells, and then uh, we'll move on to a little bit about my personal journey uh, that developed um, with, uh, with the writing of this book. Um, so my grandfather uh, was, was born in, uh, in New York in uh, 1923. Um, his, uh, his grandparents, his, his parents, my great-grandparents, came over from, uh, from Poland in the early 1900s. And uh, he had uh, he was one of uh, of two. He had a sister, uh, Edith uh, Fletcher uh, Marshak, and he had a regular normal childhood growing up in uh, in New York. In that time, he went to uh, the D. Winton uh, uh, Clinton High School, went to NYU, where he was in the School of Accounts and Finances, uh, the accounting department. Uh, he was a waiter at the World Fair, went to summer camp, had a regular you know Jewish American uh, upbringing at the turn of the century. And um, he uh, was very involved in, in Jewish cultural life in that time in, uh, in school in NYU. He was the editor of the newspaper and um, you know, just a regular regular existence in terms of, of Jewish life and American life in, uh, you know, when he was growing up. Um, right after he finished his uh, bachelor's in, in accounting, uh, he was drafted into, into the army in, uh, 19, in 1943. And, um, and uh, that's the, the next slide, if you will. And he uh, went, like many of the, like many of the, his peers, to uh, Camp Upton, where his, his journey starts. It was an induction camp. Uh, it wasn't a camp where there was basic training. Basically, um, the people of from his town, from New York, from the different areas, went to different induction camps throughout, throughout the country. And as we see here on the slide, on the on the left hand side, is um, his, uh, his the the orders for him to report to induction. And on the right hand side is the first letter that he that he sent home, the first uh, card from the Red Cross, uh, dear mom and pop, as he hand wrote on the on the template. I arrived September 6, 1943, in Camp Upton, and we see even right from the beginning his uh, sense of humor, where he signed it Charlie Dash General. Uh, day day one of the army, he kept his uh, same sense of humor, and I think what's uh, what's fascinating about the, the book in general, as you mentioned, is that it it covers 
every part of his army experience from his draft notice to the first uh, postcard he sent home all the way to his uh, his discharge in, in 1946. Um, the book has upwards of 600 letters, postcards, uh, notes that he wrote home. I'm, I'm not sure if there's another uh, volume out there that, that, that has this many letters from one person that really goes through the day-to-day -day experience of, of, of a soldier in, uh, in, in the military. Um, after he was drafted, so he joined a program called the ASTP, the Army Specialized uh, Training Program. Due to his college background, the United States Army at the time had specialized training programs um, for college graduates in order to have them have uh, jobs in the military that were attuned to their backgrounds. Um, the beginning of his training was training here in the in the 14th Regiment of the ASTP Battalion. And then due to uh, the war in Europe and the looming invasion in North Africa and all the other fronts of, uh, of, the, of the military effort, so the United States Army closed the ASTP program, and uh, the majority of the soldiers who were involved in the program were sent to different inf infantry units or to other places uh, in, in the military. And um, from ASTP, Charlie was sent um, from Fort Benning. He was sent uh, to he was sent to uh, start his training with the 102nd Infantry Division. Um, in terms of you know people who aren't familiar with uh, military um, uh, language or military structure. So uh, the, the 102nd Infantry Division had 16,000 men in it uh, total. Um, there were three infantry battalions as part of the division that each had close to 3,000 men. Uh, the division artillery had close to 2,000 men, which he was um, he was part of the headquarters department. So we're talking about joining a, a fighting force of 16,000 men, where his story is is you know the the tree in the forest. Normally, when we talk about World War II or in the publications or the movies that come out of World War II, normally it's a more of the the forest and not the tree. Um, but here in in the, in the letters that we that we find from my grandfather, it really is the individual perspective of what it was like for one soldier and his day to day life, his day to day routine um, in, uh, in in the military. Um, what also comes out uh, very strongly throughout uh, his letters is his Jewish background. Uh, his Jewish heritage and his the cultural Judaism that uh, that he had uh, during that time, um, throughout his correspondence, whether it's in in, in America or whether it's in uh, during during Europe, we find here uh, that's on the screen now the Yom Kippur service um, from Fort Benning in 1943, a Rosh Hashanah card that was sent in 1944, a letter from the chaplain. Uh, the, wrote back to Charlie's to my great grandmother about meeting him at the the Jewish service. Um, he was, wasn't shy at all about his uh, his Judaism. Um, he you know was very involved in the Jewish war uh, at the JWB. Uh, he was very involved in the Jewish um, fraternities where that were near the near the bases where he was in uh, in the states and even in Europe, um, as we'll see you know later on in the in, in this presentation, meeting uh, survivors from the concentration camps and seeing some of the atrocities firsthand that were that were committed against the Jewish people. From from his his draft into the into the military until his discharge, it really is a, is a, a Jewish perspective of, of 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 World War II of the people he met of the Jewish communities in the South that he was a part of that hosted him and his fellow Jewish soldiers for holidays and for different uh, engagements. Um, he never mentions in his letters uh, any form of of anti-Semitism that he uh, that he had in the in the military. Um, though in many of his letters as well, he doesn't mention things that he he thinks will. Uh, will make his parents uncomfortable or bother his parents. So I'm not necessarily sure, you know, if we can look at his letters and say that this was uh, a rule that there wasn't anti-Semitism in, in the US in that time. I'm sure there was. I'm sure there are many Jewish soldiers who did experience it, uh, but at least from the, the Jewish perspective of his letters, he really, you know, all of the, the high holidays, all the services, the Jewish cultural events, he definitely took part in uh, in all in all of those. Um, his training in, in the States lasted from, from his, his, his draft in 1943 until uh, September 1944, when, uh, when the 102nd Infantry Division uh, went over to Europe. Um, and during that time, he was, uh, in terms of, during that time, in addition to his training and the regular routine, once he finished basic training, he took the skills that he had acquired in, uh, in college as a writer and as a journalist and brought that to, uh, to the division uh, headquarters as well. Uh, here we see on the left-hand side, uh, two uh, articles, uh, two clip outs that he wrote uh, for, for the, the Pine Burr, which is a military, uh, a newspaper, and on the right-hand side we see the the division artillery bulletin, uh, which he managed to put out uh, three or four uh, volumes, three or four uh, pages of that before he uh, transferred over over to Europe. Um, and again, what's fascinating about the, this collection of letters and also these um, these these items, these artifacts, 
is uh, not necessarily that Charlie wrote home all these letters, but that my great grandmother, that she saved everything. That this was this, that this has been around since 1943 until now we're in 2022. That it was saved, that it was preserved uh, throughout this time, and that that his mother, you know, everything he sent home was, was saved. Everything he sent home, all the letters, the, the photographs, these uh, these articles and cutouts, uh, were saved. You know, was was a mother waiting for her son to come home, and uh, that they saved all of these uh, all of these different artifacts um, after. After his training uh, in America and after having uh, spent some time in, 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 in the States, so he transfers over to Europe. The division didn't go over right away uh, because as the United States military was uh, doing this push in Europe, so they were taking men from the 102nd Infantry Division and transferring them to other, other locations as well. Um, so until the division reached its full strength of 16,000 men, so they were in uh, they were they were stateside for quite a few months, uh, first in Camp Benning, Georgia, then in... Um, then in Camp uh, Swift in Texas, and then finally they moved to uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey before they uh, uh, embarked to the to the European theater. Um, so if we just give a click on the on the presentation um, after this is uh, the picture of the 102nd uh, Division Headquarters Artillery. Um, this was basically the headquarters department of the of the artillery of the 2,000 men who are in the, the artillery section of the division. This was basically the commanding general of the artillery and all of the support staff. So uh, Charlie, my grandfather, was part of the, so the support staff in the, the manpower section in the, in the HR department uh, in charge of writing reports and all the different things that had to do with movement and manpower uh, manpower transfers and all things of that nature. Uh, due to his skill as a typist and skill as a writer and uh, just having that uh, accounting uh, background. So instead of accounting with finances, so the military uh, also accounts with the, with people. How you know the the unit strength? How many people need to be it for the unit to be at the fighting uh, fighting strength? How many officers? How many enlisted men? So he took his mathematics background from accounting and basically transferred that over to uh, to the manpower uh, division, manpower directorate with, within the 102nd uh, division and specifically in the in the artillery. Um, so as I mentioned, so in uh, in in uh, July 1940, 1944, after he served his time in uh, stateside before being deployed. So uh, Charlie and the division left out of Fort Dix and uh, the, they, they disembarked in uh, Europe in uh, La Havre, uh, France. Um, from when they arrived in France, so the division had 181 days of combat. Um, it's uh, 670 miles from La Havre, France to the division's final position on the Elbe River. Um, so they, they went through, uh, they went, the division went through France, went through Belgium, Holland, and uh, finally in Germany. This is uh, the postcard, the, the V-mail that uh, Charlie sent over on the boat on the way to Europe. Uh, V-mail is a fascinating concept from World War II. Basically, um, the, in terms of writing letters in bulk and sending them back uh, stateside, so the letters themselves, you have all the sacks of all the mail, took up a lot of space and a lot of weight on, uh, on, on airplanes, which could have been used for supplies or other uh, necessary items for the, for the war effort. So they developed this, uh, this way, it's called V-mail, where basically they would take this card, write or type on the postcard, they would take a picture of it, and then the film would be sent back to the, to the United States and then printed in the United States. So basically it saved a lot of weight, a lot of space on either the aircraft or on the or on the, the shipping. And so this is a, one of the letters that he sent back um, to, to the States. As you see here, there are a few things here that, that are interesting. First of all, is the censorship of the first line. I um, still can't figure out what it says there. There's a the censorship uh, regula regulation in the, in the military in World War II. So the censor read all the mail before it was sent over. As you see in the top left-hand side, it says a passed by US Army examiner. So whatever his first line was of the letter, deemed uh, not, uh, not fitting to be, uh, to be in print, so they crossed it out. Along the top right side says still on the water. He can't give his exact location. And in, in this letter as well, we see his, uh, you know, the Jewish uh, heritage coming, coming out where he talks about his father asking about uh, Kol Nidre and Yom Kippur, as well as the different services and, uh, and things, of, uh, things of that nature. Um, the, the, if you want to keep on moving to the next, uh, the next slide, this is uh, some pictures of him in, uh, in Europe uh, with, his, with his section and uh, as well as the fact that he was uh, in a non-combat position, but however, still in Europe, um, you know, you see him on the left-hand side with his, his helmet and his rifle. Um, there are some very interesting uh, statistics that I found when, uh, when going through the process of putting together uh, this book. Uh, first of all, there were 500,000 American uh, Jews who served in the various branches uh, of the military in, uh, in World War II. 
Uh, second of all, of the 16 million American servicemen who fought in the who were in the military, only two million uh, actually served and fought in the European uh, theater, and uh, around 40 percent of all enlisted personnel were had non-combat roles. So, in terms of Charlie's unique story within the broader American uh, American perspective of, of World War II, this is really a the, the, a very um, high minority of, of soldiers in World War II had the same experience, 40% of being uh, in non-combat non -combat roles. Um, but his unique perspective of being one of the 2 million soldiers serving in Europe, as well as a Jewish soldier in Europe, uh, definitely had his, uh, his perspective uh, throughout his, his service. Um, there, are very, there are a lot of unique instances and experiences that he writes about in his letters. Uh, but one of them, which is which is which is fascinating uh, to myself, which also has become a family a family tale, is uh, he, he meeting his brother-in-law, Edith uh, Edith Fletcher, Edith uh, Marshak uh, Fletcher. Um, so Edith, uh, so Edith's husband, uh, Artie Marshak, was served in the Fourth Armored Division in uh, in World War II, and uh, Charlie Wright told me in one of his letters that he's in Paris for the day. And he uh, goes to uh, goes to a store and he sees people with the fourth armored uh, unit insignia and he asks them if they know Artie Marshak and they say of course we know him he's inside and here you know he goes halfway around the world and meets his brother in law in uh, in Paris for the day um, and the the book has has all of these uh, you know unique instances of uh, of of his day to day life throughout his uh, his time in the in the European theater. Um, it, the the division came into uh, the European theater right after uh, D Day, a few months after D Day, so they didn't have the the brunt of of the fighting. Uh, however, if we continue on the slide to the next slide, we'll be able to see the the progression of the division uh, during the combat in uh, in Europe. On on the left, we see a map of the Siegfried Line, uh, which was one of the the main German uh, fortifications that uh, defending from France uh, into Germany. Um, and on the left, we see uh, the position of, of Charlie and the division during the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and uh, the, the division artillery headquarters is at this time only nine miles from the front. So even though Charlie is in a non-combat position, even though there are also many other soldiers and officers in the division in a non-combat position, they were still very close to the front line and very close uh, to the fighting during um, during the time in Europe. And um, the division had um, had had a very hard time during the Battle of the Bulge, as many other divisions uh, did as well during during the fighting. And the total battle casualties of the division during its 181 days of combat were, were 4,922, which of that, 932 were killed in action, 3,668 were wounded in action, 185 missing in action, and 137 prisoners of war. However, in, on, on the other side of that, uh, of that equation, um, the division did had some wonderful advances in terms of the the, the tactics in terms of uh, of the, the the military push in in World War II, and they um, they they captured 147,000 enemy prisoners of war during that time, um, and they destroyed 345 enemy planes. And you know they, even even though they came into the into the war so to speak a little bit late in the European theater, they had some. Uh, yeah, they def definitely had uh, an active part in the combat and, and on the push of the, on the Americans push to uh, to uh, Berlin. Um, the, this uh, this slide, the next uh, the next two significant uh, things that come out in Charlie's letters are his meeting with the uh, Holocaust survivors, as well as uh, a face to face confrontation with uh, atrocities that happened at the Gardelingen. In a uh, Gardelingen, uh, Charlie's unit uh, was the first to find uh, find this the site. Um, there was basic there was a thousand. At 16, uh, it says here on the thing, uh, it says here on the slide, allied prisoners of war, but they were mostly a concentration camp uh, uh, victims who were on a forced march and they were put in this large, large barn near Gardeling in, uh, uh, in Germany, and they were, they were burned, al burned alive in the, in the farm. And, and uh, Charlie's unit was the first one to uncover this and uncover the massacre. And uh, Frank Keating, who was the, the major general of the 102nd Infantry Division, brought all the townspeople uh, to see the site, had them uh, bury all of all the victims. They established a cemetery there, and um, the cemetery is still is still there today and still in the in the custody of the town in terms of uh, taking responsibility for, for the atrocities that were that were committed there. Um, Charlie also uh, met um, 52 survivors from uh, the Buchenwald uh, concentration camp, as we can see in the next uh, in the next slide. And um, this is actually one of the first letters that that we found when my wife and I uh, were in, in in the states in uh, 2017. 
and we were going through my parents' attic. Um, we found this is how we found uh, found the boxes. We'll talk about the journey of, of writing of writing this this book in, in a little while. But uh, the first letter that we found, that my wife uh, pulled out from the box, was written in May 1945. And there he writes that uh, he met 52 survivors um, of, 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 of the concentration camps and all the stories they told us, you know, they told me all these stories and everything we, we read in the paper happened to them um, and they have nowhere to go. I don't know what's going to be with them. The, the Poland is a terrible place for the Jews. Germany is a terrible place for the Jews. And he concludes his letter by writing, now I understand why it was such a great place uh, for the Jewish people to have a homeland in, uh, in Palestine at that time. Uh, so this is Charlie with uh, the, the members of the, the Jewish community, the survivors that he met. And there are quite a few letters talking about his different meetings with them at, at that time in, uh, in May 1945, um, after the war. So the, the survivors of, 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 of the camps were still considered European. And there was a military rule that you couldn't fraternize uh, with the enemy. So uh, Charlie, as, as a Jewish American soldier, had that uh, that dilemma of wanting to be with his people, the Jews who he's now has, has rescued and found and been with. On the other hand, the American military and the American government at the time saying that you can't fraternize with the enemy. So in his letters, he writes how you know he's going to try to sneak out and see the and see the people. And you know it's, it, he writes about the, meeting them on on, on the Shabbat holiday and, and the babka and the cakes and the and the and the and the challah and all the different types of things that uh, that goes along with 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 with, with the Jewish uh, culinary uh, at the time. And um, and then after after World War II, so uh, Charlie stays after the the, the cessation of uh, of the fighting in VE Day. Uh, Charlie stays in Europe in the occupation forces of the American Army, um, first in the 102nd Infantry Division, and then transferred to uh, the Engineering uh, uh, Command of uh, in uh, in Europe. And finally, he's uh, he's discharged in uh, 1946 due to his father's illness. Um, so he was discharged early and uh, went back stateside and was discharged and there uh, finishes his uh, his military service. Um, in between the end of the cessations of, of, of hostilities in, in, in Europe and his discharge, so Charlie had, had quite a few months of a military occupation service in uh, Europe, uh, which he also used to go ahead and, and tour uh, the European continent. Uh, he went to Belgium, he went to Austria, uh, the Alps, uh, he flew to Scotland for a few days, uh, to do a tra army training program, he definitely made the, the most of his time there. And there as well, we, we get to see not necessarily the the combat, the 181 days in combat, but we also get to see the time spent as as an American youngster. This at this age, 22 years old, uh, the first time being uh, being in Europe, is his father chastises him for flying to Scotland uh, in an airplane because it's too dangerous. And Charlie writes, you know, I didn't do it for the the fun of it. I did it because it was. Uh, the quickest way to get there, and don't worry, I'm sure one day you know everyone's going to be flying. Uh, so he was uh, he was prophetic in that uh, in that account, and um, and and overall, really, the the the, the book is a, is a slice of of, uh, of Americana. It's a slice of a young uh, a Jewish boy from uh, from New York, from the Upper West Side, uh, who uh, who joins who joins U.S. military, very patriotic about his military service, uh, very happy and proud of of, of joining the army, um, but really under no no illusions as to uh, the difficulties of combat. He wasn't uh, rushing uh, to the front lines to be a frontline combat infantryman. He was very happy with the, with the role that he had. And um, what's fascinating in terms of the, the letters and uh, and how he writes them home, he he was he was a journalist uh, both in college as well as the beginning of his army service. And the letters really look like an, a journalistic account of what day to day life was for the simple for the simple GI. Um, there are many letters that are very philosophical, talking about his feelings, his feelings towards the Germans, toward, towards the war, uh, Judaism. Um, but there are also many letters that just, you know, the day to day, what we had for lunch today, what movie we saw in the afternoon, what books I was reading, um, you know, in terms of the, the the historical value, I would say, of these letters. Um, if anyone wants to know what was on the, the Fort Benning uh, meal plan or menu uh, in 1944, so Charlie has that in his letters. Um, and it's really, you know, again, taking the focus on the tree, not the forest. I think when we talk about history, we like to talk about the big military engagements or the or the famous divisions or the famous generals, and we forget that out of the sixteen that the sixteen million servicemen in World War II were made up of uh, individual soldiers with their backgrounds and their and their personal family histories and uh, and so on. Um, so that's that's a little bit about uh, about the book book itself, uh, the structure of the book, the letters. And uh, here we see um, the last slide is Charlie being discharged. And on the left, we see that his father had a, uh, a heart condition. 
and after the cessation of hostilities in uh, in Europe, and then also after uh, the, after Japan surrendered, um, the the army couldn't discharge all of its soldiers at once, so it had a point program of how many points a person had. It was how many times how many time they spent overseas, um, if they received wounds or different uh, criteria. So they were slowly but surely discharging all the service members. And uh, in the towards the end, uh, Charlie's uh, father had a uh, had a heart condition, and even though he wasn't technically allowed to go home vis-a-vis -vis the point system due to this uh, family uh, medical emergency, so he was discharged uh, earlier, and he uh, went back uh, went back to America and he started his post uh, army uh, life uh, in March 18th, 1946. Um, so that was the, that's the book. In terms of uh, you know writing the book was also a, a very poignant uh, personal journey for me. Um, I think that um, you know first of all my grandfather and uh, seeing the world through my grandfather's eyes at 20 years old was a fascinating fascinating experience. Um, he passed away when I was 15, and I think that um, you know as as a, as a person grows up, they only appreciate what they don't have. My own personal experience. And as a kid, as a child, or as a young adult, you see, you know, your grandparents as someone who's there, someone who's older, who's your 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 parents, you know, parents. But you really don't necessarily have such a connection with uh, with them or what they went through, or the experiences that they had. I always knew that he was a soldier in World War II, um, <clears throat> but the 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 specifics of what happened, of what he went through, of what he did, his experiences, he wasn't one to uh, tell all these stories, um, and. Um, Finding these letters really, you know, put the, put that all into uh, all into perspective, um, and I think that one of the one of the biggest lessons that, that that I learned from this, and what I try to you know to tell people when I talk about uh, this project in this book, is is say is write it down and save it. Um, you know, even if you know the personal stories, the family histories, even if right now your children or grandchildren uh, don't seem to be interested in uh, in the history of, in the history of it or what happened, or you think that you know your stories aren't worthwhile. Or you know they're nothing uh, they're nothing out of the ordinary. Eventually, someone down the line, whether it's a child when they get older, whether it's a grandchild when they get older and they start having a family, uh, will be interested in what happened and what you know what did my parents go through, what did my grandparents go through, what was their perspective on life, how did they live, and um, it'll be a shame if that's if, if that's lost. Um, you know this 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 volume, these six hundred letters, is three years of my grandfather's life at a very pivotal time. Uh, in his in his experience, and uh, it would be a shame if you know that was lost to uh, to the dustbin of history, so to speak. And everyone has a story. Um, it doesn't need to be you know a World War II story. It doesn't need to be a movie in Hollywood epic. Every person has a story. Every person has something that they can pass on to uh, to their children and grandchildren with things to learn, with you know lessons and, and life ideals to uh, to learn from. Um, so I think that's the the first thing that kind of struck me throughout this whole process of journeying with him. Um, the letters. You know, the letters were handwritten and I, I transcribed them. So as, as, as I was transcribing them, it was almost like I was writing these letters um, in terms of, you know, dear mom and dad and the experiences that he had. And it was a fascinating, uh, fascinating journey to, to, to do that. And I think it's just, you know, one of the, it made me realize the importance of passing things on for the next generation. Um, and the second of all, as you mentioned earlier, so I'm currently serving in the, in the IDF. And uh, it was definitely an experience sitting in an army base in 2022 in Israel, writing or transcribing my grandfather's letters that he wrote close to 80 years beforehand in an army base in the United States and then in Europe, and how uh, some things, uh, you know, some things definitely have changed in the army experience, but uh, how some things definitely uh, stay the same, even with the, the gap in the years and the, and the cultures and the, and the societies. I think I'll, I'll follow that up with we're getting some questions in the Q&A already. Uh, so following up what you just said about your experiences in the IDF, Gittel Falman asks, uh, how did learning about your grandfather's experiences change you today in 2022? Did this make a lasting impression that you incorporate today? Um, wonderful question, and, and absolutely. Um, you know, I, th I, think about, I think about my grandfather now almost every day. Um, I have the, the first letter that we found uh, in the box of, him, of his, his meeting with the survivors I actually have framed and it's in my office uh, in, in the army and on, on the base I am now in the IDF. Um, it's one of the, that, that story of seeing, of finding that letter and having that experience, uh, I, I, I tell over to, to all my soldiers at uh, different, different uh, meetings or discussions that I have with them. And I always tell them that, you know, if I was standing next to my grandfather 
when he wrote that story and told him, don't worry, one day, you know, there will be a state of Israel, one day there will be an IDF, one day there will be a place for uh, the Jewish people to call their own. So he would think that, I, that I'm crazy. And uh, here we are in 2022 and see uh, see what we have. I think it definitely lends perspective uh, and the, the weight of history of what it was like being a, being a Jew growing up in the, in the 20s and 30s in the United States and then seeing that whole slide of history from then until 2022, almost, uh, you know, almost 100 years, uh, 100 years now. Um, so it's definitely something that stays with me, um, the perspective of what he went through and, you know, how each person can give their part and how each person can uh, can give back to society and to the community. And, you know, again, each person in their own small way, I think, you know, his his story as 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 a non-combat soldier in World War II is one that's, that's oftentimes overlooked. Um, but I think that many people who, who did those jobs without those those non-combat support positions. So then, you know, the, the military wouldn't be able to do it to do its job. So I tell that also a lot to, uh, to the soldiers who I see here in the IDF in terms of that uh, that experience. But um, no, but his experience is definitely something that that, that has kept with me uh, since finding the letters through the project of writing the letters, as well as uh, to today. You said he was a, uh, a Zionist in most of his, his post-war life. Did he ever explicitly connect his wartime experiences and meeting Holocaust survivors with that Zionism? And do you make that so, connection today yourself? So the, I definitely make that connection. Uh, today myself, um, he he never mentioned that uh, explicitly. He also never mentioned that I can remember the fact that we had all these letters. Um, you know, the letters were were my, my mother and my aunts had the letters and they graciously provided them to me in order to uh, to do this project. Um, he never mentioned the letters, and you know, I'm sure if he would have at that time, I would have you know at least wanted to see them. Uh, maybe not go through all of them at 15 years old and read all my grandfather's old letters, but definitely, you know, to ask him more questions about his experience based on knowing that there, you know, we have these first person accounts. Um, but he never mentioned it explicitly, but but I, I can't imagine that it didn't impact him. Um, you know, he, he his his letter from in 1945 in May when he when he met the Holocaust survivors was written three years to the day of the Israeli Declaration of Independence in 1948. Um, so I can't imagine that as as a young young Jewish person in 1948 in America, after having that experience in the military, both in the states and then through Europe and meeting survivors firsthand in Europe, I can't imagine that it didn't uh, deeply impact him and his experiences afterwards. Yeah, one of the things you you mentioned it, and it's one of the things that grabbed me in the letters was his uh, when he starts as they march further and further into Europe, I, you see more and more of his attitudes, anger at the, at the German people. Uh, his attitude towards uh, Nazism as a Jewish American. Uh, could you expand on that in some of the letters, some of the things he might have said in the letters about about Hitler, about Nazism, about uh, the German people denying uh, their their Nazi affiliations? Um, sure. My, my grandfather, in many of his letters or most of his letters home, uh, really tried to reassure his parents that everything was okay. Um, definitely during his time in, uh, you know, stateside, things were really okay, so he didn't really have to reassure them too much. Um, but even in Europe, he made sure to tell them that he had a roof over his head, he had hot meals, everything was fine. Um, I think if we look at it, uh, so, you know, um, objectively, that wasn't necessarily always true. I can't imagine that being nine miles from the front in the Battle of the Bulge in one of the coldest winters that people remember, you know, he, he writes home in his... Uh, in his way of trying to keep his parents happy, that was great ice skating weather. Um, so I can't imagine that that was that was true, even for someone who was not in combat. Um, that, that you know couldn't be true. But in terms of his meeting with the Germans, he definitely um, had very, some very opinionated uh, letters about them, about the fact that uh, everyone there kind of was uh, brainwashed, as you you know, if if you will, that everyone believed either that Hitler was right and uh, and you know the final solution was the right way to go, or that everyone disagreed vehemently with Hitler and that, you know, they were just denying all, all, all the uh, things with the Nazi party where they were in places where it was only Nazi party members could live. Um, he definitely felt that they needed re-education, definitely felt that, um, that, you know, the majority of Germans at the time were, were, were accomplices uh, in, in what happened. And he, he you know, didn't uh, mince any words in terms of his, his anger and uh, his hatred, uh, you know, at that time towards uh, to, to, towards Germany, to the German people for what uh, for what occurred. Um, I'm 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 sure it had to do 
uh, for sure with the, with 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 the, obviously the Holocaust and the treatment of the, of the Jewish people in Germany. But I think also it had to do with the fact of, of World War II, how German arrogance and uh, German uh, superiority dragged the whole world into a war. And now at the end, when you know when Germany lost, now taking uh, no uh, no responsibility for uh, for what happened. Was he a a Yiddish speaker? I think I think I recall one of the letters saying he was. He spoke to some survivors, and it was like like talking to my old man or something along those. Lines. Right, right, right. So uh, he, uh, he he spoke Yiddish. Um, he spoke Yiddish with his father. He spoke Yiddish in uh, with with the survivors. He was he was extremely culturally Jewish. Um, he wasn't wasn't religiously observant, so to speak. Meaning he had no problem. I see one of the questions here is about kosher food in the army. Um, he didn't keep kosher. Uh, in any way, shape, or form, um, you know, it wasn't even something that that came up as a challenge that he had. He didn't keep a kosher home growing up. Uh, didn't keep a kosher home when he, you know, didn't eat kosher when he was in in college during his studies, and definitely not in, in the military. Um, but he was very, very culturally Jewish, very proud of his Jewish heritage. Spoke Yiddish. He went to serve. He went to synagogue on the high holidays. His letters are sprinkled uh, with Yiddish phrases uh, throughout from the beginning when he goes to the army and he talks about one of his experiences. He says, you know, the army is a little mshugana to, uh, to, to the Yiddish he was speaking, to the people he was meeting. Um, so definitely, you know, his Jewish culture and heritage comes through. Um, and I think that's also one of the, I think, the impact that impacted him so, uh, so powerfully in terms of meeting the survivors <clears throat> was being able to, uh, to converse with them in their own language, in their own native tongue, and not have to do so through a, an interpreter uh, in, in that respect. Yeah, I recall one of the earlier letters where he's, he's, I believe he's trying to report how how good the food is at camp, maybe it might have been Camp Upton, and he talked about, he was very excited about the pork. Right, exactly. And um, and, and one of the things that I that I really stuck through when I was uh, writing his letter, when I was transcribing the letters, is I felt that, you know, th this was him, these were his letters, and this is who the person, person was. You know, it would have been very easy in a word document to uh, to do uh, you know control find and delete all, all all the pork and delete all of the quote unquote Jewish uh, questionable uh, practices that he had, but I felt that you know if, if we're going to go through this project and we we want it to be him as he was put on paper in those times, so everything is included. The the, the it's six hundred and thirty four pages. Uh, the book it includes all the letters. Uh, some of them are very inspiring. Some of them are very interesting. Some of them are, you know, quite dull. Uh, towards the end of his time uh, stateside in, um, let's say, May, June, forty-four, before they transfer over to Europe, you get the feeling of, okay, so we're here, we're in the army routine, we got drafted, we finished training, and now we're kind of just uh, waiting. I think part of the, for me at least, the fascination of, of the of the book um, is you really get the full experience of what it was like to be a soldier from the the high of your first day in military service. Through finishing basic training, going to the rifle range, going to the grenade range, and all of those you know new experiences for someone in the military, to the boredom of, of hurry up and wait of now we're here, so now what do we do? Um, so I think that's you know kind of the one of the one of the fascinating things about the of the book. I think what separates it as well from other from other volumes of World War II letters or World War II histories is when you when you read it, you really have the the full experience of his close to almost three years in the military, from the highs to the lows to uh, everything uh, in between. Uh, Alan Friedman asked, uh, were you able to spend time with your grandfather while he was alive? You mentioned he passed away when you were 15, I think. He passed away, he passed away when, I was, uh, when I was 15. Um, my, my mother made a very concentrated effort uh, to, for me to have experiences with him, to be with him in the summers. Uh, she drove me up almost every Sunday to spend time with him. He would come to our, our house for weekends, and we definitely had a lot of experiences together, definitely spent a lot of time with him. Um, over this, you know, this one aspect of, of his life, he, he rarely mentioned he had, you know, three three famous things he always talked about in the Army in his service. Uh, one was singing his unit song uh, very off-key, but with a lot of uh, a lot of pride in being a, a member of the, of the Ozarks of the 102nd Infantry Division. Um, the one wound that he uh, received in combat, uh, which was uh, when he jumped over a barbed wire uh, fence and uh, had stitches on his backside. He uh, loved telling that story. And uh, the final story, um, which is also very, um, very of my grandfather, is at, at the end of at the end of the hostilities, at the end of World War II. Um, so there was a family in Holland that he was very close to uh, when they were during the fighting, and they were uh, bivouacked in, uh, in in their house. And after the, after the war, he wanted to go back and visit that family. 
So he wrote uh, he wrote a letter to his, to his commanding officer how he has a sick grandmother in Holland. They'd like to go visit. And uh, we have we have the, the 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 paperwork signed by the commanding general of the European theater, allowing Charlie Fletcher to go visit his grandmother, who doesn't exist in, in Holland. Those were the three stories that uh, he always told about the war. Um, but other than that, that never came up in our conversations. Um, but no, I you know I have very 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 fond memories of him, um, and he you know he was a very very happy man, very loving man, um, and almost everything that he that you know seeing these letters now person that that he was as I knew him when I was 15 years old didn't start uh didn't start then it started when he was 20 years old and probably even before and the personality just continued through uh day through his life uh, here's a question from an anonymous attendee did he and his did he and his experiences influence your journey to the rabbinate was that an influence on becoming a rabbi um I'm, I've actually never thought about that um, so that, that's now's a good question. <laughs> now, 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 now is the time. Um, I think that his, his influences, um, not necessarily on me, but I think his influences on on, on my mother, and uh, and you know how the, the home that he had and the education that he gave her, as well as my aunts, uh, kind of then got passed on down to me. Um, in terms of my love, my love of Judaism, the Jewish people, the state of Israel, Zionism, um, just his his nature, his outgoing nature, his love of people, his love of talking to people. Um, you know, you couldn't be around him and not be, and, and not feel like you were a friend with him, uh, not feel like you were friends with him. And he would go into a room where he didn't know anybody and, you know, come out with five new friends. And I think that the, 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 the people skills, so to speak, uh, that you need to have in the rabbinate or need to have in any, any sort of pulpit or chaplaincy, um, I definitely feel that I got from him. Um, I don't know if that, you know, drove me to the, to the rabbinate per se, but definitely the, Wanting to wanting to speak with people, wanting to be around people, wanting to have experiences with people, definitely, it definitely came from him. Uh, an anonymous attendee points out uh, Fort Benning will soon change his name to Fort Moore, named for Colonel Hal Moore, who was a hero in Korea and Vietnam. Um, your grandfather was a uh, Upper West Side uh, New York, come from this very Jewish background. When he's initially sent down to uh, to Georgia and then to Texas. Uh, Though, were those culture shock experiences or, or, or did the military insulate that? Um, they, they definitely were. And um, he writes about that in his, in his letters as well. Um, not, not at length, um, but there are definitely a few instances where he talks about um, you know, the difference between the treatment of African-Americans in the Northern states at that time and the treatment of African-Americans in the, in, in the, in the Southern states. As well as the you know the 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 Jewish experience in the South vis a vis the vis a vis the the North, um, he was also you know in terms of of the time a very well educated man. He uh, he joined the army at twenty years old, already having his bachelor's, um, and I'm sure after he left the ASTP training program, which was for college graduates, and was sent to the 102nd Infantry Division, definitely met people not necessarily even where he was stationed, but from in the unit itself who uh, couldn't read and write. You know, one of the, the way he got his job in the, in the headquarters was they lined up all the new recruits and asked, you know, who can who can type? And five of them stepped forward and all five of them got the, the job as clerks because the rest of them couldn't type or couldn't write or, you know, depending on their, their education, uh, educational background at the time. Uh, here's one from uh, Teresa Jillick. If your grandfather was with us today, what do you think he would say to you about your dedicated military career based on what you know of him in the short 15 years you spent with him during his life? Um, I think he'll be very proud. Um, he was he was definitely a person who always gave back uh, of himself to others uh, after you know after his service in the, in the in the military at the end of World War II and going back to, uh, to Allentown, Pennsylvania, where he eventually settled. He was very active in uh, in Jewish community life, uh, very active in the broader community life. He always felt that uh, he had a desire to, uh, to 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 give back and a desire to help others. And I think that uh, you know, being in the in the in the military, in my in my experience here, especially as a chaplain, as a rabbi, is is all about giving back. It's all about um, you know giving of yourself uh, to other people. I definitely think that he would be he would be proud of uh, proud of that. Was the uh, American military ever a thought for you? Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely was. Um, my, my my father was in the American Navy in the Navy for uh, for seven years. Um, I was born on a on a Marine uh, Air Force Base in uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina. Um, so definitely was definitely what you know was always out there as a thought. Um, 
but uh, not, not, not something that ever uh, came to uh, fruition. Let's see, as uh, Frederick Singer points out, uh, the rabbi was Samson Shane, who was eventually rabbi at Shari Shomarim in Lancaster, PA from the 1950s to 70s. He helped him marry Fred and Ann Singer and was the rabbi when Ann was growing up at Shari. So uh, you grew up in, uh, what was the Jewish Lancaster, community like around Lancaster? So what, 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 what Fred Singer is, is pointing out here is that the, the letter from the chaplain uh, that was in the, in the presentation Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the small world, the small Jewish world, after being the chaplain of Fort Benning, now was uh, the rabbi in, uh, in, in in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, for for a certain time. In terms of that, uh, that closing that uh, Jewish geography circle, yeah, he seemed to manage to uh, to bring the Jewish connections wherever wherever he went, um, whether it was with with locals, with other guys uh, in the army. Um, so that was, uh, you know, part of his experience. But I think you know transferring his his Jewish community, his uh, Jewish culture to his life in the military. He saw that at several points in the letters. Mm -hmm. No, of course, he, he was, you know, I think that he was also writing home many times of things that he thought would, would be of interest to his his parents. And I'm sure that, you know, writing home to your, your Jewish mother in the Upper West Side, she's want to hear that you're having bagels and locks and that you're having herring and that you're meeting with other Jewish people in terms of that the cultural experience in terms of that that you know developing friendships um I'm sure he was friends with other people in the units you know in in, in headquarters who weren't of uh, Jewish heritage he mentions a few times uh, by name one of the other clerks who, who was very friendly with who was I think of a Polish or Italian uh, ethnicity um but I think definitely you know in terms of writing back home to worried Jewish parents who left you know Poland and immigrated to the, to the United States in, in 1906 then see their only son go back into Poland, so to speak, in 1944, the American army, um, I think was trying, it was trying to make a very calming experience. And uh, we all know Jewish mothers, no matter how many times you tell, you tell them not to worry, they're, they're going to worry. And I think that telling them not to worry in the midst of World War II, when they're reading the front page of the newspaper and their sons in, 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 in Europe, even saying that I'm in the artillery, which is far back from the front lines, and even in the artillery, I mean, the headquarters of the artillery, which is even a little bit more far from the front lines, I still think, you know, his, his mother definitely worried about him every day. And I'm sure that the, you know, writing home the little um, little things of uh, Jewish culture was, to, was to almost a calming tactic to have her feel more, uh, more at ease. Did any of the ways they celebrate holidays jump out to you as a, as a military chaplain or just as a rabbi? Um, I think that... Um, one of, the, one of the few letters that he wrote in Europe was about not having a chaplain, but not having someone in their area and uh, not sure if there will be services or what will be the event and having to kind of do it by themselves. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, the experience here as well, the, the chaplains and rabbis, whether it's in the American military or the Israeli military or really anywhere in the world, can't really be everywhere all at once. Um, so is the, there definitely is a, is a place for, uh, for, for lay people uh, to you know, take for, take the center stage as well to provide religious services for those who know how to, to know how to do so. Um, you know, the army issued um, uh, prayer books and uh, and the Bible for Jewish soldiers. He had it with him, uh, you know, throughout his service in the in the letter um, that he writes uh, right towards the end of the end of the war. As as you know, the, the war is over. Um, he said, I even took out my prayer book and said said a few prayers today, uh, which to me was fascinating in terms of the fact that he kept this prayer book with him. From his induction in Camp Upton throughout his service, uh, and you know, both in, the, in in America and in the European theater, um, and in fact, they had it with them, you know, just to be able to pull it out at, at the war's end. Something I felt felt was uh, was very interesting. Yeah, those those the, the Jewish Welfare Board prayer book that you could put in your pocket probably was handed right. to him at Camp Upton, and and he. Uh, right, but I think that in terms of you know a, a Jew who wasn't necessarily a synagogue goer on the day to day. You know, to have the there's no atheist in the foxhole, to be able to keep that uh, that with him throughout all of his journeys and all of his transfers and all of the different experiences that he had, to still have that close to two and a half years later, uh, I think is very telling of his personality and his connection to uh, to, to Judaism to have that with him uh, in the midst of uh, of all of this. Uh, Anna and Alice Roenberg ask uh, about his post war life. Did your grandfather's experiences have any effect on how he lived Jewishly after he left the service? Um, I think he definitely had a more Jewish home uh, after after the service and did during the service. Um, I think that was partly because of, of my grandmother, 
who came from a more uh, traditional uh, Jewish uh, background. Um, you know, he was very active in in all three of the synagogues in uh, even four synagogues in Allentown, Pennsylvania, the Orthodox synagogue, the conservative synagogue, the uh, reform synagogue and the reconstruction synagogue. He kind of, you know, went around all the different places, made friends everywhere that he went. He had a very strong Jewish identity um, as an adult. And I think he passed that on to uh, to his three daughters, to his grandchildren. He was very proud of being Jewish. He you know, was definitely something that was important to him. Um, I think that as as a young adult, you know, in the 1940s, being 20 years old in the in the American Army, I think that was almost a it's insurmountable challenge to uh, to have a you know that that type of experience. But definitely after the war, when he when he settled down, he got married, had children, had a family, it was definitely I think at the forefront of, of who he was as a person. Interesting, yeah. So and that sometimes there's a phenomenon where you where you when you when you're not in a place like the Upper West Side of New York, you got to work a little harder to be Jewish, where it just comes comes naturally, and that's probably true right. in the military as well. And he definitely seemed to do that. Uh, Ellis Sheva Greenberg, uh, your grandfather was a patriot and a Zionist. Do you feel you are as well? And how do those feelings coexist? Well, so that that's a wonderful question. Um, I was actually asked that question. Two years ago, um, uh, the Joint Chief of Staff, uh, General Mark Milley, came for a visit uh, to Israel um, as, as part of the American delegation. It was the, the eighth night of, of Hanukkah, and uh, he came for a meeting with uh, the Chief of Staff of the Israeli Army, and as an English-speaking uh, chaplain in, in the Army, so they invited me to come and uh, participate in the candlelighting ceremony that, uh, that they had there. Um, and it was, you know, it was a very uh, powerful experience to be there with with you know my quote unquote native home of, of of the of the United States where I was born where I was raised and my my new home here in in Israel, I think that um, the connection between the United States and Israel is a very powerful one is a very strong one, and I think that you can be very um, you know very universally pro American values of of democracy and and you know the American way of life so to speak on on a universal level but also be very quote unquote, particular in terms of your Jewish values. And I think that the, the bond that America and Israel has, um, I think that one can be a very Zionistic as well as very you know, patriotic in terms of being pro, being uh, American as well. well. Let's see, this is one, I guess, just kind of uh, related to, to World War II. Have you ever talked to the people who live in the kibbutz that was settled by the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? I have not, I have not. Um, but um, there, there, are, there are plenty of, of museums and institute and institutes in uh, in Israel that deal with you know the the military experience or, or of the Warsaw Ghetto, as well as the, the experience of uh, soldiers from Israel who fought with the British during uh, during World War II. Uh, but no, I haven't reached out uh, to them uh, specifically. Okay, well, I think uh, we, with that we can just about wrap up. Did you have any uh, final thoughts, uh, Rabbi Gerstein? No, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for joining us. Um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure to, ch to share my, my grandfather's story uh, with uh, with everyone. And uh, as I said about you know my personal journey of putting uh, this work together, I really would just encourage everyone here uh, to take you know take the time to look at their own personal story and see how they can uh, pass that on to their children and grandchildren. Uh, because you know because it's it's a, it's a very powerful uh, moving experience and definitely something that will be cherished uh, for the time to come. I just uh, hold on, let me. Do this one more time. I'm attempting to send a, post a link to Amazon to the book in the chat. Uh, we do also have the book available in our museum store, so you can order that through, through our online website, or folks in DC can, can come into the store, and we have the book available. Uh, we'll also send out a follow-up email with, uh, with links to the book and uh, with links to the recording of this talk. Uh, thank everyone for being on, and thank you Rabbi Gerstin, oh, one last question for Sharon Robinson. Is there going to be a movie? <laughs> As of right now, we're uh, just working on, on, on the book and getting his uh, story out there. Uh, didn't think I was going to write a book, so I uh, can't, uh, can't say no to a movie, but we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being no on. And, uh, we, will, we will be uh, in touch. We got a couple more of these uh, webinars coming up in two weeks, again, again, in three weeks. So uh, keep an eye on for what we've got coming up, and we will. Thank everyone one more time for being on. Have a good night. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.